So here we are. Okay, so hello. My name is Patrick. Uh, on GitHub, you know me as Rugvip. Um, I'm one of the maintainers of the Backstage project. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, Colben. Uh, I am Lam on Digital. Uh, I've been working at Spotify for like three years, um, nearly four actually, working a lot on Backstage. Yeah, and also maintainer. And we started the same day. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to talk about uh, how we are evolving the backstage backend system. So we're going to look at what it looks like today for building backends. We're going to look at where we're headed and why we're headed in that direction. And we'll also dive a bit... <laughs> That's better. That is much nicer. We'll also dive a bit deeper <laughs> into how the new system works uh, and uh, end with a bit of a comparison. So first I want to give you a bit of history of the current backend system and how it came about. So when open sourcing Backstage, we had a pretty well built out uh, plugin system for the front end. But on the back end, there really wasn't much uh, at all for, for plugins. And we had also taken the decision to rewrite uh, all of our back end uh, systems into Node.js. So we basically started from a completely clean slate. And we started very simple, just uh, with a pattern for how to set up an HTTP router uh, to serve the back end APIs. Then over time, um, we added more plugins, things grew, we added more utility services for things like logging and configuration, database access. And as backend plugins got even more elaborate, we started seeing extension patterns for plugins. So you can now add things like entity providers in your catalog or custom actions in the scaffolder. Now all of these new things grew out while we maintainers were kind of frantically trying to keep things a bit consistent across the project. So that's led us to where we are today, where we're quite powerful tools for building uh, elaborate backend plugins. So what does a backend plugin look like today? At the heart of it is the create router. Uh, every plugin exports this function or something like it. And it's essentially a, uh, anything that gives you, uh, or a plugin is anything that gives you an HTTP router to serve external traffic. And then through the options, for the create router function, the plugin can accept any kind of uh, options or dependencies that it needs uh, to get started. Now, this design is extremely flexible because it, it's, it's just a function. You can do anything with a function, really. Uh, but with this flexibility, th there's a lot of cost. So when you have something that is this flexible, it's very hard to provide any utility. So from, from the framework's point of view, we can't really hook in and help out in any way, because there's no points for us to do that. So let's zoom out and see how this create router um, method is used. So the, this code handles the setup of the plugin, right, where you supply your dependencies from the environment and any other extra options, and it lives in a separate file in each backend installation. And to be clear, there's a copy of this file in every single backstage instance that uses this plugin. So this file is just copied over and over again. Well, at least it's pretty simple, right? So what's the problem? It's kind of what we thought in the beginning, too. So, yeah, as Patrick's leading on to here, it does bring a couple of headaches. So let's look at the installation of the, an existing backend plugin today. So these instructions seem to be very plugin specific. Uh, and in most cases, they're always available in the readme. I'm sure this looks pretty familiar to people today. As you might be able to see from the instructions, we first need to install the package from NPM, then we need to create a file which is named after the plugin, and then import that into the backend, into the backend package, and then wire it all together in the HTTP router. Now, we're about evolving an existing plugin. So let's say I'm a developer and I want to add access control to my plugin. Now, luckily, we've got a permission service that's super simple. So to use it, I need to update my plugin to accept it as an option to the create router. Now, requiring permissions is a breaking change, and that line that you can see on the slide needs to be added to, for every installation of this plugin. This will continue to happen to ev for every capability uh, we add that requires a new service to be passed from the outside. What plugin authors d ended up doing is basically just making this optional. Now, that's kind of problematic because it means we need to deal with optional code from like as a producer of a plugin, uh, as an, uh, like as a developer, and also as a client that's going to use the plugin itself. 
Um, I think that's fine. So let's look at the catalog installation. So this is code that you will recognize, I think, today, because this is basically adding the scaffolder processor to the catalog. So the processor we're adding here is what we now call a module, which extends the catalog with new features. It's, it's essentially a plugin for plugins. The way that modules and plugins interact is completely up to each plugin, and there's no real standard pattern for it. So let's imagine we want to evolve any part of this setup. So let's look at the API surface. So changes to how the builder is constructed can be breaking, changes to how add processor method and the processor interface, that can also be breaking, changes to how the entity processor is constructed, that can also be breaking, you get the point. Like, there's a lot of breaking changes here that we could make. The API surface is huge. So with all this in mind, we tried to make the situation better for both end users and plugin developers. So based on learnings like what we've just seen, we, wanted, we basically set out with a design for these higher level uh, like list what we wanted to do. So first and foremost, we wanted to simplify the installation of a plugin. So having to create multiple files and managing imports is just too much of a hurdle and it's a hassle for people trying to integrate with Backstage. We wanted a much simpler process, both for plugins and modules. So secondly, we also wanted a few breaking changes. So by reducing the API surface exposed by these plugins, we want to get rid of the situation where everyone needs to update their backend code when we introduce new features or new services for plugins. We want less code in the backend setup and move all of this backend wiring into the backend system itself. Like we're going to build a framework, so let's hide away all the hurdles that people have got to jump over. Let's move a lot of that stuff to the framework. And we wanted the system to feel recognizable. So to anybody that's been working with front end plugins, it should kind of just be a really simple switch to writing back end plugins, right? We've got a lot of that framework already built in the front end. So let's take advantage of that. And we also wanted to make it easy to evolve and extend. So users shouldn't have to invent or learn new pattern for every plugin. Now, how did we go about building this new system? So we started sessions and design sessions and prototyping at the beginning of this year, uh, using a top-down approach and focused really heavily on the backend setup and installing new plugin and slimming that uh, down to what you need to get up and running. Uh, we settled that and found a design that we were happy with and published it as an RFC, so sometime in the middle of May. Um, and you all seemed hap pretty happy with our approach, so we got straight into building the new system. And that was around summertime, and then we've been shipping early versions of the systems for the last couple of months. Now, let's explore what this system looks like with a high-level overview. The base of the new system is the backend instance. You can think of this as the unit of deployment. The backend itself really has no functionality at all. It just is responsible for wiring things together. Next, of course, we had plugins, which house the actual features uh, just like in the existing system. So plugins operate completely independently. If they want to communicate with each other, they have to do so over the wire. So there can't be any direct access between plugins. Now, because of this constraint, a plugin is very much like a microservice. Now, it's up to you to decide the way you structure your deployment uh, in, in your backend installation. So you can take all of your plugins and put it in a single backend, or you can go the other way and the other extreme and split every single plugin into its own backend, or something in between, all depending on your need to scale and isolate individual plugins. Next up are services. So we don't want plugins to have to implement everything from scratch, right? It wouldn't be a very good plugin system. Uh, so to make it simpler to write plugins, we provide access to services like the current ones, the database uh, task scheduling and configuration. Now, those are the built-in services, and there are many more. But you can also import existing services, and you can well, easily create your own custom services as well. Now, like the other building blocks we've seen so far here, um, services is nothing new. What is different, though, is that we now uh, provide the back, they're now provided from the backend through dependency injection. So this means you no longer manually need to wire up your backend uh, to pass services to each plugin. And a shout out to Yussi from Rode for helping out with that earlier. On. <laughs> we also wanted services to be a customization point. So just like in the front end, where you can uh, replace services. So you can completely replace a service, or you can also take an existing service and customize it, like uh, changing the middlewares of the HTTP service. 
Now, we've also seen these plugins for extensions or extending plugins themselves, like the processors in the catalog and the actions for the scaffolder. So we have now created a common pattern for these types of extensions that we call extension points. So they function a little bit like services where you depend on them and they're registered into the backend. But rather than being provided by the backend, it's the plugins that provide the extension points based on what each individual plugin wants to expose, what kind of customization they want to expose. And extension points are also decoupled from the plugins themselves and exported separately. So it's much easier to evolve and deprecate individual extension points rather than dealing with one single huge API surface. Now the last piece of the puzzle are modules, uh, which uh, use the plugin extension points to add the actual features. So a module might, for example, add a catalog processor or a scaffolder action. And modules are quite similar to plugins. Uh, they also have access to services. But one key difference is that they must be deployed together with the plugin that they extend. And each module can only extend a single plugin. So in many ways, a module is a plugin for plugins. All right. So let's take a look at what this new backend system actually looks like in practice. So all of that set of code that you used to have in the backend has now been distilled down to a single function call, create backend. By moving all of that set of code into the system itself, it's a lot easier for all of you to maintain the backend. And it's also a lot easier to evolve and extend over time. There's plenty happening under the hood, of course, uh, like wiring up all the built-in services that everyone has to manually configure before. We also choose to split out the startup into a separate function call, which makes the API a little bit more flexible, and it also makes it easier to add custom logic. This code, obviously, is not going to get you much more than just like a bare bones backend. So let's add the catalog plugin. So rather than having to manually create and copy the contents uh, from the readme that we saw before, um, we now have everything in one single call. So note that there's no arguments being passed into this catalog plugin, and all of its required services have been provided into the backend, uh, provided from the backend. In through dependency injection. Wow, mouthful. This means there's much less code needed if you stick with the defaults, uh, but it's also possible to make deep customizations. So you might notice that the catalog plugin is a function call. That's because we give you the ability to pass in additional options for making lightweight customizations. So now let's look at an example of installing a module. So this is probably conceptually the biggest change that we've made from the, from the previous system. As we mentioned, modules now are first-class citizens that you can create and install rather than some loose pattern invented by plugins themselves. So in this case, you can see that the scaffolder module extends the catalog by adding a processor for software templates. So let's see how this thing works under the hood. So I just want to make this clear that this is not code that you have to write to integrate with plugins. This is something that you would make as a plugin author. Uh, so to create modules, for instance. So this is how it's implemented in the scaffolder, for instance. So we'll start with the scaffolder module, because it's a bit simpler. So you can see that we can create a new module. We give a plugin ID and a module ID. And as implied, that only means that uh, one, a module can extend, only, extend a single plugin. So in register, we add the init function for this module. We declare a dependency on the logger service and the processing extension point from the catalog. If you're familiar with the front-end plugins of Backstage, this is the same system that we use for utility APIs. As all of our declared dependencies, are then, uh, as all of our declared dependencies then get passed to the init callback. Finally, in that callback, you can see how we use the catalog extension point to add a new processor. Modules are always initialized before plugins, so therefore there's no race condition between each other. Now, Looking at the catalog plugin, you can see there's a lot of similarities from the previous module example. Again, this code is housed in the catalog plugin itself. So the main difference between uh, the main difference compared to the scaffolder, mo uh, scaffolder module is that we register an extension point to be used by the modules. The reason we settled for this particular sort of nesting and callbacks is so the extension point implementations can be accessed directly from the closure and the init closure itself. This makes it much easier to build extension points since you don't need to juggle internal and external services and dependencies and interfaces. This is a slimmed down version of the catalog implementation, but in reality, the catalog plugin is configured exactly like this today. The upside is that this code can evolve without having to get users to update their code themselves. 
And lastly, for people that want to go a little bit more extreme and do a little bit more customizations that we talked about, you can see how we can replace uh, service APIs just like we do in the front end. So for instance, here we're replacing the logger with a cloud logger instead. We also added the ability to supply default implementations for new custom services, which means that you'll be able to import and use them right away without having to wire them up beforehand. All right, uh, let's look at some comparisons uh, between the current system and this new one. So in this example, I have a Kubernetes client service in an external package that I want to Im uh, import and use in my plugin. So if you want to do this today in the current system, there are a lot of hoops that you need to jump through. So obviously you need to import it into your own plugin and wire it up and use it. But there are also many changes that you need to ask uh, users of your plugins to make to their backend installations. So first off, uh, you need to ask them to do what you see on this slide and add the uh, package as a dependency. Then they also need to update the plugin environment type to include this new service. And they also need to update the backend wiring to create a manager and a plugin specific instance of this service and forward it to the environment. And lastly, they also need to uh, forward the service from the environment to your plugin. Now, that's a lot of wiring that everybody has to do for something that really should be simple. So in the new backend system, this is a lot simpler. Uh, thanks to the introduction of default service factors, uh, all you need to do is import and declare a dependency on the service. As long as the service has a default factory, that factory will be used to create an instance of the uh, implementation for the service at runtime. Now, this means that users of your plugin won't need to make any changes to their backends at all, unless they explicitly want to override uh, that service implementation. One of the more visible uh, changes uh, between the new system and the old one is the reduction in code size of a typical backend installation. So comparing the setup of a newly created project, th there's a quite massive difference. Uh, so rather than nine separate files with 348 lines of code, we now just have a single file with 26 lines of code. That's more than order of magnitude uh, difference. So overall, this gives an indication of how much easier it will be to manage a backend installation once we've rolled this new system out. I'm sure something a lot of you are thinking is, no oh, crap, another migration. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, th there, there will be some, some pain to upgrade. Uh, but as we saw on the last slide, it's mostly about deleting a bunch of code, especially if you have a somewhat standard setup. So you delete the plugin specific uh, file and you replace it with a one liner in the index file. Now, any customizations to the backend wiring, uh, where if you've done cu um, custom services, that would need to uh, be replaced with a custom service implementation. And any plugin customizations would be either options or uh, migrated over to be modules instead. Now, you'll be able to find uh, both general and plugin specific uh, guides for this in our upcoming migration documentation. So overall, this is going to lead to a much slimmer code base and going to be a lot, that is going to be a lot easier to keep up to date. So what about migrating the plugins themselves to the new system? It might get quite complicated, right? Oh, so we've, we've done a bunch of these already and usually what you need to do is you take the create router and you wrap it up in the create backend plugin instance. You depend on whatever services the plugin needed before and you also depend on the new HTTP service where you register the router and then you're good to go. Now the plugin can accept options for any of the more lightweight customizations, but if you do have a plugin with more complex patterns, that m probably needs to be migrated over to the extension points instead. So, in summary, the backend sim uh, sy uh, system simplifies the installation uh, of new uh, plugins. It will be a lot less code for you to manage and there's gonna be way fewer breaking changes. If you're used to the front-end APIs and even the current back, uh, backend system, these patterns are going to be recognizable. And it is going to be a lot easier to evolve and extend this new system compared to the current one. All right, so what we've shown today is available for testing. Uh, so if you like what you've seen, you can give it a spin. Uh, we'd love for you to share any findings or feedback, either directly with us here uh, or in the backend system channel on Discord, which I just created an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> now, you can also read more in-depth uh, documentation that will be evolving as we build the system out uh, at the link at the top. 
Uh, and we don't have a specific date in mind for a stable release. Uh, we really want to give this time to settle and respond to feedback, but we're hoping for some time early next year. So uh, hopefully we have time for some questions, uh, but you can also find us here, of course, and uh, later on at KubeCon. Thank you. Martina will run around, so if there's any questions, raise your hand. Objections about migrating again? <laughs> <laughs> so, we're not even expecting that to be um, available for us to experiment. Available. Can't promise anything. So we're, we're hoping next year, but it really takes time, especially from uh, just our experience with the uh, front end. Okay. Um, um, building out the front-end APIs as well. We discover things uh, that we didn't think about that need to be addressed. So it, it does take time to, to build this out. But um, no, the more feedback we get and the more people try it out, the quick, quicker it's going to be. And also the question was, when do we expect this to be avail available? Thank you. I think there's one here. So, question is, what about running this system in parallel with our current one? And is the current uh, one going to be deprecated? I hope so. Yes. <laughs> it's basically the answer. I, so, we haven't talked a lot about running them in parallel in the same backend. Um, so, as mentioned, plugins, they, they are quite a lot like microservices. You can't, can really split them apart and move them over one by one from two different installations if you have a big and complex setup that you need to migrate. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Sort of a related question. Uh, if you're running multiple replicas in the, for the same uh, deployment, uh, four pods, for, for example, um, how how friendly is this uh, migration going to be for uh, not killing your three other pods as one of them updates? So I guess... So How much testing of that has, has gone on? So I'm maybe struggling for the answer here. So I guess if you mean what you have, you want to replace the exit, like the, the migration for running a new system. And if, yeah. I mean, I guess the APIs have the contract, right? So like the APIs of your public facing APIs, like the catalog API, whatever you're using, that's the contract that that's not going to change, right? It's just the wiring together of the backend system that surfaces these plugins is going to change, right? Sure. So I guess for in terms of downtime, I don't think you should have any. I don't think there's any migration from an end user point of view. It's just integration point of view, a plugin author point of view. Does that answer your question? Sorry, I'm uh, kind of unsure if that was the answer. I, I guess for, for clarification's sake, um, Database migrations. Mm. I'm assuming this comes with database changes. Uh, no, I don't think it does. No, 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 no it's oh, nothing right. like that. No. So you this is basically just all JavaScript, TypeScript code that what does all the wiring of the backend together. You just like made the, my team much happier. Yeah. See, the plugins are all the same still. <laughs> yeah. It's just the actual export of things from the plugin. So the database migrations are a contract somewhere else. Like this is just what the plugin exports and how we wire everything together. Thank you. Right. Cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> we got there in the end. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, I'm curious if that's the right forum. Uh, what's the roadmap of data model uh, evolution uh, for uh, Backstage? <laughs> so, <laughs> data model evolution and Backstage. I think the catalog SIG yeah. is the best place to show up and discuss that. Mm. Yeah, I would say so too. I mean, in terms of roadmap and what we have planned, um, kind of hard to say. Um, don't really know it yet. I'm going to defer this to product somewhere <laughs> at some point. <laughs> um, but yeah, not sure. I think SIG is probably the best place to start, that we can start uh, driving that roadmap and driving our next um, priorities, I guess, is the catalog SIG. So you can find information about the catalog SIG in backstage slash community, I believe? Mm -hmm. Yep. Good. Yeah. Taras has a question. <laughs> This is for Charles, so 
This is Charles' question. Um, what are your thoughts on being able to unmount a, mo a module once it's been activated, like at runtime? Dynamic plugins. I remember that discussion. Yeah. We're, we're looking at um, most likely introducing some form of life cycle service to kind of hook into events of startup and teardown. Um, just especially for startup, uh, startup where you want to get HTTP, HTTP serving, uh, listening, kind of at, at some specific point when the backend is ready. Um, no concrete plans yet. Work with us to implement it. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, it seems that we have no more questions. Well, one? Uh, one. On this migration, uh, <laughs> I'm expecting that you guys will do some guides, how to guides, and as well as some nice uh, tutorial uh, video to show, because if I'm kind of a little bit looking at how much effort we need to put in, uh, uh, I'm migrating the current one to the new one. So, so. Yep. Change within this batch page, uh, some kind of thing. Yeah, I guess. So, kind of I guess maybe it's possible. I think like the pattern of like code mods, I guess, is what you're essentially talking about. So the question is, is can we make uh, migration easier? Um, I think it's hard, right? Because there's quite a lot of handwritten code already that's kind of very specific. It doesn't really, fit. and like when we mentioned in the presentation that there's no real standard for it already, it's kind of hard to detect these patterns and make it easier, it's gonna be, you know, there's gonna be some effort, but it's mostly hopefully gonna be deleting code, like Patrick said, which is always good, we always wanna do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, of course we'll have documentation, of course. Um, we, do we have some documentation already? Some documentation is up, migration documentation is yeah. not up. Yeah. So I, also where the backend system is kind of coming from is the pain to migrate or upgrade. Yeah. So that's kind of the thing we want to address as well yeah. with, with this new system. Great, so give it up. Thank you, thank you so much.